All righty. All righty, all righty, all righty. Uh, Father, we just thank you again. Uh, help, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We welcome the living water of the Holy Spirit tonight. Uh, thank you for just encounters that we have with Jesus that teaches us who the Holy Spirit is. Thank you for giving us something that we're searching for. And many of us don't even realize we're searching and searching and searching. Holy Spirit, you're the only thing that can satisfy and fill us, empower us, and lead us and guide us. And we just pray that you would have your way in this place tonight. I pray that every single person here would walk out different than when they came in. I pray that every single person here would be filled with the power of your Holy Spirit, living water, a stream that will never run dry, that will satisfy our thirst forever and ever. Teach us not to drink from alternative wells that never satisfy our thirst. Teach us to drink from the well that gives life and life abundantly. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you brought your Bibles with you, take them out now. Go to the book of John. Let me see those Bibles. You really need to be bringing your Bibles. Really need to be bringing your Bibles. This is a discipleship ministry where we make God's word practical. We're going to study God's word. Uh, and we're going to apply God's word to our lives. We, one of our anchors, Anchor 8, is allow God's word to become the authority over our lives. And we believe that the word of God, when we truly embrace this discipleship pathway, the word of God sets us free. And in this book, it's so critical for you to bring this book each and every week. So if you don't have your Bibles, don't sweat it. We're going to have the scriptures up on the screens. It's a long scripture, and I just want to pick it up in verse 7 from the book of John. And I'm reading from, uh, it, my translation says, Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus asked her for a drink. This is significant. He was alone at the time as his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised that a Jew would ask a despised Samaritan for anything. Usually, they wouldn't even speak to them. And she remarked about this to Jesus. So in this translation, it actually tells us that Samaritans were despised. Jews never associated with them. They never talked to them. They never hung out with them. So here Jesus shows up at this well with this Samaritan woman, and they're about to engage in an epic conversation that changes this person's life and gives us insight to how we can be satisfied for the rest of our lives. Just another context as well, when you're looking at this entire story, and part of our pillars of, of encounter is evangelism. This is a great evangelism model for us when we evangelize to people. When you want to talk to people, witness to them. Because we're all, a, the great commission is not a church initiative. It's your responsibility if you've accepted Jesus Christ. You're to come and see. You're to go and tell. You're to go and tell after you come and see, follow him and go and tell. So we're to tell everyone about Jesus. We're to share our faith with every single one. And you may be the only Bible translation that someone will ever read. And Jesus, it's a pretty good translation in this encounter. Jesus replies to her, if you only knew what a wonderful gift God has for you and who I am, you would ask me for living water. Everyone say living water. Now, this woman is about to engage in a conversation. She thinks she's going to try and one-up Jesus in every single part of this conversation. But she just doesn't get it when he says living water. She says, but you don't have a rope or a bucket. So right away, what Jesus was talking about went right over her head. She said, and this is a very deep well. 
Where would you get this living water? And besides, are you greater than our ancestor Jacob? How can you offer better water than this which he and his sons and cattle enjoyed? Jesus replied that people soon became thirsty again after drinking this water. But watch this. But the water I give them, he said, becomes a perpetual spring within them, watering them forever with eternal life. Did you catch that? Jesus says, the water I give ain't like the water you're drinking. I got much better water, water you don't even know of. And it's going to be like a perpetual swing, spring that's forever going to be flowing that will give you eternal life. She doesn't get it again. She takes the conversation to a whole new level. She says, please, sir, the woman said, give me some of that water. And I'll, be never thirst I'll never be thirsty again. And I won't have to make this long trip out here every day. And Jesus is about to mess with her. I love when Jesus messes with people. And Jesus says, all right, we'll go and get your husband, Jesus told her. And the lady said, but I'm not married, the woman replied. Jesus says, all too true. Jesus said, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. Someone say, busted. She's busted, but he doesn't condemn her. He loves on her. He welcomes her. This is a conversation where Jesus is trying to reach her, and Jesus knows all about her just like he knows about me and you. He knows about what we do. He sees us, and he knows our condition. She gets busted, and watch how quickly she tries to turn the conversation. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. But say, tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worshipped? She changes the whole conversation. And Jesus replied, Jesus says, you really want to go there? All right, let's go there. And Jesus replied, the time is coming, ma'am, when we will no longer be concerned about whether to worship the Father here or in Jerusalem. For it's not where we worship that counts, but how we worship. Is our worship spiritual and real? Watch this. Jesus is not talking about singing songs. When you heard about people worshiping in the Bible, he's talking about how you live your life. Remember... Remember our signature discipleship verse in Romans 12, 1 and 2. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies a living sacrifice before God, holy and pleasing. This is your spiritual act of worship. Worship is not how we sing, but how we live our lives. Worship is our devotion with God. And God is looking for people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And so Jesus is saying, Jesus is bringing up this issue of worship. And then he says this, do we have the Spirit's help? When was the last time you asked for the Holy Spirit to help you in your worship? Not only when you sing, but how you live your life, how you worship God. Holy Spirit, help me honor the Father. Holy Spirit, help me honor Jesus. Holy Spirit, help me honor you. Holy Spirit, thank you for being the temple in my body. Thank you for declaring me clean and holy Help me worship you in spirit and in truth. Help me not to defile my body in Jesus' name. I offer up my body a living sacrifice before you. I can't do it, but you can because your power is made perfect in my weakness. That's what Jesus is talking about here. She still doesn't get it. Jesus goes on to say, for God is spirit and we must have his help to worship as we should. The Father wants this kind of worship from us. Did you catch that? But you Samaritans know so little about him, worshiping blindly, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes to the world through the Jews. Now the woman thinks she's going to pull out the ace in her back pocket. She's been saving this one. And then she says this, well, at least I know that the Messiah will come, the one they call the Christ, and when he does, he's going to come and explain everything to us. Take that, man. And Jesus told her, well, that would be me. Drop the bucket in the well. Jesus said, I am the Messiah. You know, we all come into this world thirsty, don't we? 
From the time my daughter made her first cry in the delivery room, she began rooting around for some water, something to drink. God planned it this way. Our bodies are 50, 60% water, and they have to be replenished continuously. When we go without water, we get dehydrated. We cramp up, and our head starts to pound. We need water to keep our, our lips moist enough to swallow, to even preach a sermon. Uh, we need water to keep our vital organs plump enough to function, our joints lubricated enough to work. One week without water, you could simply dry up, you could even die. We also come into this world spiritually thirsty. All of us do. From the time we're born, we begin our journey thirsting for living water to satisfy our souls. Many of us don't even know it. We don't realize it or we're in denial about it. But God has placed that deep desire in each and every one of us. And until we have an encounter with Jesus at the well, we're all just going to fumble around trying to quench the God-given thirst with anything and anyone who will offer temporary relief. And that's what it is. It's temporary. The Samaritan woman at the well, well, she tried drinking from many shallow streams. And she came up empty every single time. They all left her thirsty for more or at least for something different. And Jesus shows up and offers us something different, something miraculous, something that will quench her thirst forever. Jesus offers flowing, refreshing water, water that bubbles up from the indwelling Holy Spirit, quenches every thirst washes away every sin, flows into every nook and cranny of our beings and satisfies our souls. And nothing else will satisfy our souls other than the love of God made possible by the person and work of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And he invites us tonight to have a drink on me, on him, so we'll never be thirsty again. Amen. I mean, think about it. How many of you ever just woke up one day and said, you know what, life has got to be more than this. There's got to be something more to this thing called life. It's got to be something better, something deeper, something significant, more to this thing called life. And you've heard me talk about resurrection power, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You've heard me talk about that the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk but power. And we have power over sin. We have power over strongholds, over addictions, over hurts, over our adversaries, over the grave, over death. We have power over all those things because greater is he that lives in us than he that lives in this world. And God has given us the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead that lives inside of us. That's real power. We talked about that last week. Real power. I'm not talking about behavior modification by your own effort and discipline. That's what people in a lot of recovery programs do. And they wind up in a spin cycle of insanity, of trying harder, doing the right thing, falling, getting back up again, trying harder. It's a spin cycle of insanity. But life transformation, miraculous healing work of the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit's power flowing in and through us like a river that never ends is what I'm talking about tonight. Jesus clearly demonstrated that this could be made possible. He stood up one time in John and he said this. He stood up and he shouted to the crowds. And he says, if anyone is thirsty, let them come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And the scripture says this, when he said living water, he was speaking of the spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the spirit had not been given yet because Jesus had not entered into his glory. According to Jesus, the Holy Spirit is that source of something more. That's what we're thriving for. That's what we're searching for. That's what we need the most. That's the only thing that will give you peace and power, contentment, purpose in life. This is why we're doing a series on the Holy Spirit. 
This is why Jesus invites us to have a drink on him. Now the phrase Jesus used, living water, was meant to evoke, among other scriptures, Jeremiah 2.13, which says, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, which by the, by the way is a great name for Jesus, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. What's a cistern? It's a broken, dried up well. That's all it is. They have forsaken me. They've dug, dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. See, many of us can relate to this concept of living water. It's just another term for fresh water. The stuff you use to water plants, grow crops, clean dishes. The stuff you drink to live. And importantly, it stands in opposition not to dead water, but salt water. Salt water looks good. Looks like fresh or living water, but if you drink it for any length of time, it'll kill you. I just moved back from the state of California. This is so ignorant that that state is dried up. They're always experiencing droughts, and they're right on the Pacific Ocean. Where they have all this water that can be converted to living water, but they won't do it because they're concerned about little minnows that may die. Therefore, there are fires and people die because little minnows are more important than the people dying in the fires. Where's Jeff Foxworthy when you need him? <laughs> A person could be stranded in the middle of the ocean floating on top of trillions of gallons of it and actually die of thirst. See, the more salt water you drink, the thirstier you get. Now, if there's a better picture for sin, somebody stop me right now. It's not just that our souls need living water or will die of spiritual thirst. It's that we're dying of thirst because we drink from alternative wells. Chugging down salt water instead of fresh living water. We do it all the time. And like the body, the soul can't go very long without living water. And if we're drinking from alternative wells, like insecurity, unforgiveness, meaninglessness, loneliness, hopelessness, emptiness, boredom, dissatisfaction, worry, anxiety, passivity, men, and many other dry wells, they'll make us thirsty for more water. Our souls are constantly crying out for something to drink. And so we drink. But all temporary forms of refreshment, sex, drugs, success, fame, busyness, entertainment, travel, materialism, are in the end just salt water. In the moment, they taste good. They feel good. There's a good payoff. They feel good on our lips. But in the end, they only make us thirstier. If we persist in drinking them, will become spiritually terminal. So if you feel unsatisfied with your life and you want a fulfilled, meaningful life, you need to take Jesus up on his offer and have a drink on him tonight instead of looking for satisfaction elsewhere. See, we're always looking around, trying to find something to make our lives happy and significant. Well, if I wear what they wear, then I'll be cool. You got guys trying to get in skinny jeans, size 10, when they were size 18. What in the world's going on there? Well, if I can just have this plastic surgery here, here, and here, my life would look really good. If I could just get this job, I'll be satisfied. See, and not only have we rejected God and not looked to him to meet all of our needs and satisfy our needs, we're also trying to meet our needs on our own. And those wells we've dug called a career, good looks, or recreational activities, they aren't going to hold water. Now, is having a, a good career, looking your best, or having a hobby a sin? Of course not. But it's when we place those things above God that it is. And the more you make an idol of something, the more control it has over you. Sin is addictive. It only makes you thirstier. If you don't believe that, just ask someone who's looked at pornography. 
once is not enough. Sin creates a, a greater thirst for satisfaction. If you have a problem with shopping, you already know that it, it's 117 days away from Black Friday. And it doesn't matter what's going to happen on Thanksgiving Day. It doesn't even matter if Jesus is coming back on a white horse. You're going to be in front of Best Buy beating up some other Christians, most likely the Presbyterians. So you can get a large screen TV, come back to encounter and say, praise the Lord, I got a 50-inch TV. But Jesus offers us living water that will permanently satisfy your thirst. So if you feel unsatisfied with your life, you know what that's called? It's called spiritual thirst. And the only one who can quench that thirst is the one who says tonight, have a drink on me. Being thirsty and drinking water that never satisfies isn't the worst tragedy. Everyone has had a drink of bad water, has had a drink of rotten water. But the greatest tragedy by far is for those who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior into our hearts. We know where the best water comes from. We know where the best water comes from. Yet we still drink the same salt water we used to drink before we became followers. See, when we feel the thirst of insecurity, do we turn to God? Or do we buy clothes, lift weights, clamor for attention, flirt, judge others, put others down, get self-righteous, or even get jealous? I'm talking to you Christians. The holy ones. When we feel the thirst of loneliness or dissatisfaction, do we turn to God or do we overeat, binge watch TV, play on the computer, fantasize, or even act out sexually and use sex for attention, even convincing yourself that sex is love when all it does is fuel your lust? When we need confidence, do we rely on God or do we jack up ourselves with music, caffeine, Red Bull, self-talk, TED Talks, self-reliance, and what the world says. And when you think you don't fit in with the crowd and you long for that acceptance, do you run to Facebook and you post something hoping for a record number of likes just to make you feel better? Where and who are you running to to satisfy those thirsts? And though we have living water inside of us, the Holy Spirit within us, we satisfy our thirst in much the same way that unbelievers do. In truth, many of us are consuming it daily by the gallon. And this, when you clear everything else away, is at the core of our dissatisfaction and thirst. We're not filled with, we don't walk with, we don't drink from the Spirit in the way that we could and in the way that we should. And I want to tell you today, there is a difference between the Holy Spirit living in us and being filled with the Holy Spirit. There is a huge difference. Ephesians 5, 17 says, therefore, we learned this the first week, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. You would have thought the Apostle Paul said, then don't drink. But he gives the answer. Be filled with the Spirit. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Well, it's a command. Filled doesn't mean like a glass, but to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Because alcohol, drugs, and the Holy Spirit all have the ability to alter your mind. And you're either going to be transformed by the renewing of your mind or destroyed by the altering of your mind by drinking from alternative wells. You see, amazing things happen when people are filled with the Holy Spirit and living water is flowing out of them. Max Lucado says, the Wizard of Oz says, look inside yourself and find self. God says, look inside yourself and find the Holy Spirit. The first one will get you to Kansas, the latter will get you to heaven. And the Bible tells us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Have you ever wondered what that means? See, a lot of people have a lot of different opinions on what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. See, a lot of us think it's always an emotional experience to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, it could mean that, 
But you could have this encounter with God and have no emotional experience to speak of. And that's possible. Now, I'm sure we'd all love to have an emotional encounter with God every single day. I mean, I'd love to get zapped every single day by God and just have like a Cosmo Kramer, you know, just experience with the Holy Spirit when I wake up every single day. And that would be awesome. Holy Spirit, just zap me every day. You know, and that would be awesome. Holy Spirit, fill me today, you know, and, all, and that would be great. But it doesn't have to be that emotional experience. In the book of Acts, we read of the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon the first Christians and filled them. That was like an explosion. That was like 3,000 Kramers all going out. That was like an explosion that happened that set the early church, the first church, into motion. And there are many people who have prayed for another day of Pentecost. But what we really need is people like me and you to do what the disciples did after Pentecost, as a result of Pentecost. And then you'll really know what it means to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. See, what the Holy Spirit did on the day of Pentecost, pouring out his power on the disciples, is available to every single person here who will put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It's available. Amen. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's word is true. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will remain forever. Nothing about God's word has changed. And whatever has happened in the book of Acts could be your personal testimony. All the book of Acts is, is God taking ordinary people and doing extraordinary acts in their lives. And God wants to rewrite the book of Acts in your life too. Question is, will you let him? When you start driving a car, there's this vroom, there's this explosion when you turn the key or push the button, depending on what kind of car you have. But once the engine has started, after the initial explosion to start the engine up, you know what you do after that? You just drive the car. You just drive the car. I mean, imagine driving your car and your car starting up every three minutes. Boom. You wouldn't want that. That's aggravating. You just want a car that keeps on running. That's what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. You don't need the explosion over and over again. Just one to start the engine. Now, thank God for those powerful, emotional, life-changing encounters of the Holy Spirit. I, I've experienced a lot of them. God wants us to experience them because God's an emotional spirit as well too. And he wants us to experience his presence God wants to bless our lives with life-altering moments in time where we do experience his presence and his power. Last week, when we were talking about the power of the Holy Spirit, Carrie was up here worshiping, and she declared to everyone here, folks, I got to tell you, the Holy Spirit is here. God is here. And as soon as she said that, a rushing wind came into this building. I don't know, some, some, so many of you came up to me and said, did you feel that? Did you sense that? There was this wind that, I mean, it almost knocked me over on stage. And I love that. And God's touched me in so many miraculous ways. But if I don't sense his presence and I don't sense his power, I know he's still powerful and I know he's still there. See, God wants us to have the faith that whether we sense his presence or not, we know that he's always with us because nothing could ever separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And we are never beyond the reach of his power and love and comfort that lives inside of us. And that's why the scripture reminds us in Romans 1.17, the just shall live by faith. See, the word filled has many descriptions and illustrations, and I love the one Greg glory uses in one translation of the word filled, he describes this concept of the wind filling the sail of a ship as it carries it out to sea. I love this illustration. By that definition, to be filled with the Spirit is to allow God to fill your sails and guide your course through life, making his commands a delight and not a burden. See, loving God means keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Burdensome. For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. 1 John 5, 
2 through 4. The word filled also speaks of something that is ongoing and continuous. You could translate it, maybe a different translation would be, be being filled with the Holy Spirit, just like you have to put gas in your car. Be being filled with the Holy Spirit, because we need the constant filling of the Holy Spirit. And the good news is that God's not going to charge you. It's free. All you have to do is ask. But you have to ask. Because you have no Holy Spirit, because you ask for no Holy Spirit. I know Christians who go through an entire lifetime never praying for the Holy Spirit. I would have people at churches that I worked at in Colorado, in Illinois, they would actually come up to me and say, oh, don't give me the Holy Spirit. Don't even give me the Father. I just want to follow Jesus. And they don't, and they're only operating maybe even one-third spiritual capacity, and they're missing out on the power and the love and the understanding and the fullness of the glory of God that comes from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three in one, yet separate. The Father sent the Son. The Son did his work. The Son says, it's better for you that I go. Jesus and the Father are in heaven. They're not with us. But the Holy Spirit is. He's the only agent of God we have with us. Jesus is with the Father. The Father's with Jesus. Now, can we pray to them? Yes. But they're not with us. The Holy Spirit is with us. And he's with us whether we feel him or not. See, a lot of people want that emotional encounter. But the Holy Spirit's job, don't miss this, you may want to write this down, is to teach us the truth of Scripture, guide us into the will of God, transform our character, gift us for service in the church, empower us to obey, suffer and endure hardship. Somebody say amen for that. I, I dare you. And share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. The key to being filled with the Spirit is not just in experience, but in obedience. Don't ever miss that. John 14, 21, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. How does he show himself to us? I don't know. I'm not that smart. I know who he, who he does it through, the Holy Spirit. He does it through the Holy Spirit. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you're always in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Whatever you go through, you take him through. Whatever you look at, you make him look at. Whatever you do, you make him do. Whatever you experience, you make him experience. That's why it's a good job to let him create your experiences for you. By giving you living water that will transform your life. And the more you surrender your life to his control, the more you're going to sense his love and power and presence in your life. Think of this as a voluntary choice to surrender your life to the Holy Spirit's control. In other words, be sensitive to his leadership, his guidance, obedient to his promptings, and dependent upon his strength. He's speaking to you every day. How many times a day do you hear the Holy Spirit's voice? If you say none, it just simply means that you've not allowed him to fill you with living water. And that's going to change tonight. It doesn't make you a bad person or a wrong person. It just means that God says, that's going to end. I'm going to fill your thirst. I'm going to satisfy your thirst. I'm going to fill you up where you always hear my voice. God wants you to know the voice of God. God wants you to know the power of God. God wants you to know the presence of God the peace of God that the world doesn't offer. And God wants you to share that with others. You see, the evidence of the Spirit's control is always revealed in the person's character. Those that have yielded their lives to Christ's leadership are continually transformed into His likeness. That's the Holy Spirit's job. The degree of surrender determines the degree of transformation. The degree of surrender opens up the door to the level of what type of experience that you'll have. 
There ain't a lot of people, they want to get zapped every day, okay? But they don't want to obey God. They want to talk about God. They want to represent God. They want to prophesy over people. But they don't want to obey God. They don't want to submit to God. They don't want to be like God. Stay away from those people. They're dangerous. You'll always know them by their fruit, Jesus said. Most of the time, the power of the Holy Spirit is released in your life in quiet, unassuming ways. Nudges, gentle whispers. My son, my daughter, I love you. Go tell that person I love them. Do it now. Go give that person $100. Oops, thought that was the Holy Spirit for a second. No, it is. You see, Christ-likeness is not produced by imitation, but by inhabitation. You can't become like Christ until you allow the Holy Spirit to consume your life. And God wants you to experience what it truly means to be full of the Holy Spirit, and here's the reason why. He loves you so much. He loves you more than you could ever want to be loved, love him back, or love others. He wants to do good in your life more than you want to be good. He wants you to be so blessed, so healed, so anointed, so powerful, so full of wisdom, so full of peace, so full of a testimony that the world needs to hear. He wants to bless you with his life. And here's the reason why. He wants your life to be his life. And he wants your story to be his story. And when you make your story his story, then your story becomes the greatest story ever told. God wants to recycle your pain and make you a trophy of his grace and send you out for the world to see and hear how good of a God he really is. That he's still in the miracle working, chain breaking, grave robbing business because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So here's my question for you. If you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, sick and tired of the same old, same old, are you ready for living water to change your life? Are you ready? And, you know, I got like three yeses. It's like, you know, you know, you know. If you've been thirsty for something more, and you know that deep down there has to be something more in this thing called life, are you ready? For fresh living water to satisfy your soul. If you've been running to the wrong well, drinking salt water, and you want a taste of this living water that produces life and life abundantly. Are you ready for fresh living water to satisfy your soul? Do you want to be filled with the Spirit? You know, God, God doesn't want to fill us with the Spirit so we could go around acting strangely, being a goofball for Jesus. God wants to fill us so we, he can have good representation, that you can operate in the fruits of the Spirit, love, patience, kindness, faithfulness, long-suffering in your life. Always remember, God's looking for good fruit, not religious nuts. If you want to be filled with the Spirit and you want to turn from drinking salt water and turn to God, Peter tells us, Peter gives us the instructions. He says this, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give everyone an opportunity to do that in just a second as I ask the worship team to come on up. See, when you believe, or trust, repent, turn, and receive Jesus into your hearts, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, but you still need to pray for the Holy Spirit. And you need to pray to him all the time. That's why when people talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's just the Holy Spirit giving you all his gifts, giving you all his power. You know, do you want a glass or do you want to be, you want to be drenched in a bucket of living water? 
I want to be driven. You know, when my mom gave her life to Jesus Christ, four months before she passed away, hated God, never wanted to do anything, never wanted to, to have anything to do with Jesus Christ. When I called her up, I told her about what it means to be born again. She thought I'd join some hee-haw cult because I lived in Kentucky. I could never witness to her. But God uses pain to get our attention. And four months before she passed away, she gave her life to Jesus Christ in a miraculous way. And I'll never forget, uh, I was in my sister's basement. She confessed Jesus Christ, and I dropped a bucket of water over her head and baptized her in Jesus' name uh, because I didn't want to take any chances. And those were the best four months of her life. She experienced the power of God. She experienced the hand of God. And she went in singing and dancing. And she, she probably didn't even know what she got herself into. But we need to pray for the Holy Spirit. You need to pray for his gifts. You need to pray for his power. You need to pray for his peace. You need to realize tonight that anything and everything God wants to do in your life through the Holy Spirit comes through prayer. Again, we're reminded by the words of Jesus and he says in Luke, for everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. So if you sinful people know how to, good give, how to good, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So we're going to pray for God to fill us. Pray for God to live inside of us to gift us with, his, with gifts, miraculous gifts, the gifts that he chooses to give. I don't want anybody feeling bad because you prayed for a gift and then someone told you you don't have enough faith. It's God who chooses the gifts that he wants to give to you. God determines the gifts that he gives. Bottom line, you pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're baptized in the Holy Spirit if you prayed that by faith. Amen? Stay with me now. Don't lose me. Don't go drinking from another well. See, when you receive the Holy Spirit of God who lives inside of you, that's a one-time event. But when you ask to be filled again and again and again, you're drinking the fresh living water Jesus was talking about. You get out of the way, and you just start saying yes to all the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And you allow God to do whatever he wants to do in your life. If you want to get close to God, you have to learn how to run errands for the Holy Spirit. And God says, if you're faithful over a few things, I'll make you ruler over many. And God will reward your faithfulness to saying yes to the Holy Spirit's prompting and filling, especially the filling of this living water that Jesus promised us. To allow God to produce the things he wants to produce in you, all you have to do to say, I'm all in. I want to take you up on your offer tonight, Jesus, to have a drink on me. If you need fuel for your life, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Get filled with the Holy Spirit and you'll get fulfilled in life. That's the only way you'll be fulfilled in life. Happiness is found when we're filled with the Holy Spirit and we let him leave and we let them lead our lives. Friends, drinks are on the house tonight at Encounter. Courtesy of Jesus Christ, who invites you to have a drink on him, I promise you it'll be the best happy hour you've ever been a part of. I'm going to ask everyone to stand up. I'm going to share two last scriptures with you. At the end of me sharing this with you, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to invite every single person to come forward tonight and get filled with the Holy Spirit. Revelation 21, 5 says this. He who, he who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Does anyone need a new start tonight? Anyone need God to make things new tonight? And then he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give the drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all of this. And I will be his God and he will be my son. 
and my daughter. Is that a great promise for you tonight? Revelation 22, 17 says this. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to commit your life to Jesus Christ. And maybe it's a, a recommitment because you never really committed your life in the first place because when you committed your life, you were still drinking and continue to drink from these alternative wells because you missed what a real salvation experience and being filled with the Holy Spirit is all about. So I want to lead you in a real prayer of repentance. When you accept Christ, what repentance means is you simply start walking in a different direction. Repentance says, I'm walking this way, and I acknowledge my sins, I see my sins, I repent of my sins, I turn from my sins, and I leave my sins and put them in the hands of Jesus, who died for my sins, became my sin, so I can be forgiven of my sin and never have sin, have power and dominion over me ever again. I'm going to invite you all to come up and take communion. There's communion at every table up front. I'm going to invite you to pray with people that will pray that God will fill you with the Holy Spirit. We're going to worship. We're going to find out who really is thirsty. I believe we're all thirsty. I'm thirsty. Are you thirsty? Are you ready for living water? Well, pray this prayer either for the first time or a prayer of recommitment. The Father, I have sinned. I've sinned against you, myself, my family. I repent of those sins. I turn from those sins. And I trust you, Lord Jesus, to forgive me of my sins. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart what I just declared. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for writing my name in a book never to be erased. And now I pray for your Holy Spirit to fill me, to give me gifts, to empower me, to live the life that you've called me to live. Give me some of that water. I'm thirsty, and I don't ever want to thirst again because I want to drink your water, a perpetual spring of living water that will never run dry. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, would you raise your hand and let us say, oh yeah, come on, come on. Amen. 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 Come on now. Let's worship. Let's pray. Let's take communion and let's drink from the well that never runs dry.